Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In The Biological Basis of Ethics, Peter Singer discusses a number of different overlapping forms of altruism. Altruism is behavior that is motivated by the welfare or well-being or prevention of harm to another, often at the sacrifice of one's own interests, but although not always necessarily so, and he talks about kin altruism, something that's very demonstrably there in most human beings, and which plays a major role in ethical decision making, whether it should or shouldn't, that's, that's a different topic. He also talks about reciprocal altruism, where we behave altruistically towards those who behave altruistically towards us, for the most part, and those who don't, we shut them out or punish them or feel indignant to, to them in some way. And that's still more or less at the level of individual relations. And then there's what he calls group altruism, where we're considering those who belong to a group that we identify with as worthy of our altruistic or beneficent behavior and those who are not as not being so worthy and we behave in that way. And all three of these intersect with and interact with each other. They can be understood to some degree as expanding circles. And this comes from his book, The Expanding Circle. So that's not an idea that's unique, of course, to Singer. That goes all the way back to ancient thinking uh, in, in both the Western tradition and also in various non-Western moral theories as well. So Singer is going to talk about group altruism and the role that it plays in ethics. He says, in the previous chapter of his book, we saw that most sociobiologists believe that kin selection and reciprocity were more significant forces in evolution than group selection. He's interested in how we, we came about to be uh, beings that favor those in our group. And he says, nevertheless, we found some grounds for believing group selection might have played a role. And he says that we can put aside non-human animals. We're not going to worry about them. When we look at human ethical systems, the case for group selection is much stronger Although in view of the clear interest each society has in promoting devotion to the group, it is here even harder than in most cases to disentangle biological and cultural influences. So what can we actually say about that? He says, we can say from the biological side, early humans lived in small groups, and these were often reproductively isolated from each other by geography or mutual hostility. So conditions necessary for selection on a group basis existed. He's not, that's a fairly weak claim. He's not saying that this is automatically how, uh, you know, human evolution worked and how it influenced our psychology or anything like that. He's just saying, listen, um, this is the conditions that we started out in and that's what we, you know, ended up with. Can we find a link along the way? So let's think about what he says about group altruism. As I pointed out, he views it as uh, something different from, but often reinforcing kin and reciprocal altruism, although there can be a lot of dilemmas as we see in you know, ethics where uh, reciprocity or kin altruism could be opposed to group altruism. We should uh, always prevent stealing within the group, but my kid is stealing and I don't want to turn them in. Now we've got a conflict between kin and group altruism. So what is group altruism? He talks about two sides to this. 
One part is loyalty to the group as such, as opposed to simply to the members of the group. There's something that goes beyond the, the mere aggregate or gathering together of individuals who share some sort of common property that produces a loyalty, which could be viewed as higher, could be viewed as more expansive. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, that produces this, this sense of loyalty, uh, willingness to, to be altruistic to the group as a whole, to sacrifice one's interests for those of the group. And so he says that, um, here we go. Once the obligations of kinship are fulfilled, the boundaries of our own expand to the next largest community with which we identify. And he says, beyond this, this priority of concern for the welfare of others, of our background, uh, you know, our particular group, there is a loyalty to the group as a whole, which is distinct from the loyalty to the individual members. We tend to identify with a group and see its fortunes as to some degree our fortunes. And that's, you know, he doesn't go much further into depth with it, but that's a really good way of describing what's going on. When we see people behaving altruistically towards their group as a whole, there's usually some sort of way in which they're getting something out of it. It could be that they're getting prestige because of being the, the great hero or you know, devoted person or sacrificer or something like that. But they also view that group as, in a certain way, identified with themselves. They, they find themselves within the group. Or, you know, in the case of particularly narcissistic individuals, the group may simply be a reflection of their own glory or something like that. So he says that this is, this is uh, quite important and plays a major role in our, our life. So there's a loyalty to the group as a whole. Often this also involves a hostility towards those who don't belong to the group or to other groups. So there's what's often been called a us versus them mentality that can accompany group altruism and indeed, in many empirical cases, can be shown to, to be there. Um, another important point that he makes, and I think this is even more important in our 21st century present than perhaps in you know, the distant past, is that the group that we're identifying with and feeling a sort of altruism about does not have to be a local or regional grouping. What do we mean by a local or regional grouping? Identifying with your village, identifying with your tribe, your clan, your grouping, you know, within ancient Athens with your deem, right? The neighborhood that you belong to, which is also connected with, with uh, kinship ties and things like that, but in, in which you may have been adopted. Um, regional groupings, what are we talking about there? Well, you know, being a, in my case, resident of Milwaukee, a Milwaukeean, or a Wisconsinite, or an American, right? Or a North American, right? Or however we're going to figure it. Those are, in fact, um, affiliations and identifications. And we're not saying that those aren't uh, matters for group altruism, but there is the possibility of groups that aren't bound in space in that way. He says that it could be an affiliation based not on living in the same area, but on a shared characteristic. What are some examples? He brings up ethnic or class background or religious belief. These can be incredibly powerful ways of tying people together that extend you know, far uh, past any sort of geographical boundaries. And, and oftentimes transcend them in their importance. Singer brings up patriotism as an interesting example to look at from an ethical perspective. He says that, um, you know, uh, the persistence of group loyalty in modern times is, is only too clearly demonstrated by uh, ways in which patriotism could, could go 
drastically wrong. Hitler's success in arousing nationalistic feelings of the German people. Uh, You've got to admit that he had a lot of assistance from people. Uh, it wasn't just him. Stalin's need to appeal to Mother Russia rather than the defense of communism to rally the citizens of the Soviet Union to the war effort. And then he says, in a less sinister way, so this, this is you know, not just those sorts of drastic examples, we can witness the appeal of group loyalty every weekend by watching the behavior of the crowds at football games. He has in mind, of course, soccer. And, uh, but we can think about American football as a prime example of this. There's, you know, here in the United States, we have some rivalries. So people come up from the next state over here to Wisconsin with Illinois license plates, and they get called things like fibs. You can look up what that means if you want to. And, you know, people who are wearing green and gold may say to people who are wearing blue and, and orange, uh, the bears suck, right? And if you go down to Chicago, well, you know, they... they don't like the Packers there as well. Now, these are irrational group loyalties, are they not? But they play a role in, in moral life. There are people who think themselves entitled to behave in certain ways towards the other, ways that are not altruistic, but actually hostile to them. And then there are way, uh, ways in which people behave altruistically to those who they, they view as being on the same team as them in some way. So to use an example, I'm driving along and I see you know, somebody's car broken down and, and they're looking for help and they happen to have a big Packers flag on their, their uh, uh, car in some way, you know, perhaps hanging from the radio antenna. And I, I pull over and I say, go pack. And I get out and I start helping them with their stuff. Whereas if, you know, I, I'm driving along now, I, I actually personally would help a Bears fan, but I could well imagine some people driving past, seeing the Illinois license plates, a Bears flag and giving them the finger as they, as they drive past. That's an example of group loyalty affecting whether one is altruistic or not. Rather silly example, but you know, we see that. Coming back to patriotism. If we think about how patriotism works, um, is it really going to be a rational thing? He says, um, our ethical codes reflect group feelings in two ways, corresponding to the difference between group altruism manifested as a preference for altruism directed towards individual members of one's own group, the sort of examples I was giving just a moment ago, and group altruism manifested as loyalty to the group as a whole. So let's take the sports analogy again. On Twitter, the you know, Packer Nation says that I should retweet this thing and try to get as much uh, awareness for whatever's going on, some fundraising effort or something like that um, for my, my team. I retweet it and I say, go Pack Go, right? With the hashtag and all of that sort of stuff. That's, that, that's group loyalty there. That's manifesting in altruistic action for the group. Not much in that case, right? Doesn't really cost me anything to retweet something and I may actually get some, something out of it. But there could be other demands that are made. And indeed, when it comes to patriotism, very often significant demands get made upon people. So he says that, you know, um, going on a little bit, the group ba bias of our ethics in respect to loyalty to the group shows itself in the high praise we give to patriotism. And he says, this is a great question, why is it that my country, right or wrong, can be taken seriously? And he means can be taken seriously from an ethical perspective. How is it that we can actually say my country, okay, there, there's an affirmation, right or wrong. So even if my country is doing the wrong thing, I'm going to support it because that's the right thing for me to do. There's a weird paradox there to patriotism, is there not? He says, why do we regard patriotism as a virtue at all? We disapprove of selfish behavior, but we approve of and indeed encourage group selfishness and gild it with the name of patriotism. Here he gives a prime example, uh, something that's been quite controversially lately and, and uh, ought to be so. 
He says, we erect statues to those who fought and died for our country, irrespective of the merits of the war in which they fought. One of the reasons why Robert E. Lee, leader of the Confederate Army in the Civil War, is such an admired figure in American history, is that he put his loyalty to his native Virginia above his publicly stated moral doubts about slavery. And we could go much deeper into discussion about that. Suffice it to say that not too many people up here in the North actually buy into that. Singer is from Australia, so he can, you know, be, it's understandable that he doesn't understand uh, all of the, di the dynamics of this. But if you go down south, there are quite a few people who feel that, uh, uh, you know, they may condemn racism, slavery, Jim Crow, all of this sort of stuff, but they'll still say that it's, it's an important part of their history and heritage, and they'll hold him up as, in some ways, a moral exemplar, a view that many of us up here do not share, by the way. Um, he points out that there's, there's other ethical points of view that are very critical of patriotism. He talks about uh, the most enlightened and progressive thinkers like Diogenes the Cynic, who declared himself to be a citizen not of one country but of the whole world. That's what cosmopolitanism actually means. Um, the, the world is my polis, the cosmos is my country, my nation, which means that I don't identify with this particular place and its prolectivities and its history and you know, its feelings about right and wrong, which are often quite wrong, but rather I look at things in a more universalistic sense, appeals to universal values. He brings up the Stoics, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius argued that our loyalty should be to the world community, not to the state in which we happen to be born. Now, Marcus Aurelius, of course, was an emperor. Seneca served an emperor, not a particularly good one. Uh, so this is a little bit tempered, but you can find other Stoics saying similar things as well. Voltaire, Goethe, and Schiller expressed similar ideas of world rather than national citizenship. And he says, so if, if people have realized that... There really is, you know, one race, the human race, humanity as such. Why is group altruism still so strong, strong enough to be this thing that we call patriotism? Um, and, you know, maybe there's some sort of basis for it that is not a purely rational basis, but does in fact impinge upon ethics. He says that, um, patriotism has proved difficult to dislodge from its high place among the conventionally accepted virtues. The explanation for this could be that patriotism rests, at least in part, on a biological basis. But the explanation could also be cultural. In both cases, there would be an adaptiveness to patriotism, to group altruism in that respect. And he says, listen, we're not actually going to be able to identify um, precisely what the, the evolutionary basis of patriotism is. Most likely there's a complex interaction between the two of them. And he says, biological and cultural explanations are not inconsistent unless foolishly we try to insist that one of these two is the sole cause of a complex piece of behavior. And he says, that's very unlikely. Then he also points out that uh, one other thing about, about patriotism, that um, some things that may have a more biological basis, for example, preference for one's own ethnic uh, community or type or whatever that's, that's going to be, uh, may have a stronger biological basis than patriotism does. But he points out, in a multiracial society, strong racial feelings are a disadvantage. Strong patriotic feelings, however, are not, which could you know, lend some credence to the idea that patriotism is perhaps more on the cultural side, less on the biological side. Wherever it comes from, it is something that we do have to be a bit wary about, and, and really any sort of group identification that produces altruism to members of the group and something other than altruism, like hostility to members, uh, to people who are not members of that group or are members of other groups, is something that we want to be careful about from an ethical perspective.